Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so uh, as you all know, the title or the name of this uh, PNS course is Exploring the Processing in Memory Paradigm for Future Computing Systems. For short, we are just going to call it Processing in Memory. Uh, my name, as you can guess, is Juan Gomez Luna. I'm a senior researcher in uh, Professor Mutlu's group. He is the um, the one who coordinates everything in this um, uh, PNS uh, and and all uh, of his courses. The only thing that I'm doing here is like leading and coordinating the different TAs, the different uh, supervisors that you are going to have uh, in this um, PNS course. The information, I mean, you, you already know what this is about, right? That's why you uh, you enrolled in this course. Um, but I wanted to actually, you know, paste here the information that you can find in the course catalog, uh, because I, I believe that in the objective of this um, uh, this information is where where you find the keys to understand what this is all about. What what is the concept of uh, processing in memory? And if you read this uh, abstract, you will find several terms that are uh very important to understand um the 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 thing that we are going to work on the first thing is the data movement between memory units and compute units i'm pretty sure that you all know the von neumann model um that was um like uh, proposed like 70 or 80 years ago um <clears throat> by john von neumann and um and and there it, what we uh have is like two main units in one unit we store the data and we store the programs and in the other unit uh, we uh, compute we perform arithmetic operations or uh, logic operations or whatever now the problem is that we need to move uh, data and not also data but also um, uh, program instructions from the memory to the uh, to the compute units to the processor in some way so the problem with this is that it is spending a lot of uh, execution cycles, but even more worrisome is the amount of energy that is spent on this. So in a recent uh, paper, in a recent study of our group, uh, we found that 60, up to 62% of the total system energy was spent on moving data between the memory units and the compute unit, on between the DRAM memory and the CPU. Um, and this is what we call the data movement bottleneck, and um, and and this affects uh, most uh, of important workloads these days, like machine learning and AI workloads, genomics, graph processing, databases, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, um, how can we deal with this? Well, we uh, may pay more energy and we may assume the performance degradation that is produced by this data movement bottleneck or we can propose a different paradigm, a paradigm shift. And this is what we call processing in memory. Essentially processing in memory means uh, placing the processing elements closer to the data, closer to the memory. And this might be next to the memory or near the memory or might be uh, actually inside the memory array itself. And these are the different uh, approaches that we are going to uh, to study, to, to um, get familiar with in this uh, uh, PNS course. And this, uh, this is a, a slide, you might have already seen it if you watch Professor Mutlu's lecture. This slide um, is from a presentation by Bill Daly in High Peak 2015. And it's, um, even though the numbers might be already a little bit old, because it's uh, from 2015, five years ago, but, um, the, but the trends are exactly the same these days. And, and, and this is very representative. You can compare what's the um, amount of energy that you need to move to access data from DRAM to the energy, energy that you need to uh, compute uh, double precision operation on that data and you will see that it's uh, three orders of magnitude. I mean, this is just, um, might be a little bit exaggerated, but um, in reality, it's something like this. We, we know uh, that this measure, so this um, 
difference in energy consumption with the, between the memory access and the uh, date and the um, compute and the processing is around two or three orders of magnitude, which is a lot, as you as you can imagine. So this is the main motivation for processing in memory, for proposing this paradigm shift, all the uh, researching, architecture, researching um, uh, software that we are doing to, um, in some way, adopt this new paradigm. And, um, and this is what motivates uh, uh, everything. So what are the main goals of this uh, p and S course? Um, well, let's start with the contents. Let's start with the different things that you, you're going to learn here. The first thing is to introduce the data movement bottleneck. We are already doing that. Um, and, and we need to understand very well what this bottleneck represents because it's a major threat to high performance and energy, efficient, and energy efficiency in current computing systems. Uh, the second thing is that you will learn what are the key workload characteristics that make a workload, a particular workload, uh, more prone to the data movement bottleneck and um, consequently more suitable for the, proce the processing in memory paradigm. So um, it's important to understand uh, when one of the modern workloads that we are going to consider here and we are going to analyze um, it's um, already, let's say, good enough uh, when running on a current CPU or on a current GPU, or there is really something that is going wrong and is related to the memory access. And if that's the case, then we will propose some solution. And the solution is going to be called processing in memory in whatever uh, different uh, form that we adopt or we decide to use. Um, one more thing here is that you will uh, review traditional approaches to alleviating data movement and you also will get familiar with the new research proposals. When I talk about traditional approaches to alleviating the data movement, I'm thinking about, um, about uh, components or mechanisms that the current CPUs, GPUs and other processors already have, like for example, um, I, I assume that you all are familiar with the architecture of a CPU, so you know that inside the CPUs we have um, we have uh, uh, caches that are memory spaces that are closer to the processor, usually or typically smaller than the size of DRAM or the size of the main memory. And what we do is that we place data that is uh, frequently used in these caches so that they are closer uh, to the processor. That's a way of alleviating the data movement, right? Because instead of having to go all the time or for every single access to the uh, DRAM or to the main memory, you can access in this cache, which will be L1, L2, L3, and, um, and it's much closer to the processor. Or another, um, another way of alleviating this data movement is using prefetching, which essentially means that we um, have some sort of unit there that it's it's able to predict what are the next memory accesses that uh, our program uh, it's going to perform and brings this data brings these cache lines to the to the caches before they are really needed and when I'm saying when I'm saying that these uh, for example these two approaches right the caches and the and the prefetching alleviate data movement um, it's, it's clear that they alleviate data movement in terms of performance, right? In terms of um, execution cycles, because if the data is closer, when you access it, you already hit the cache. So um, you can uh, continue or you can proceed with, the, with, the, with further computation faster. But um, something that is uh, really arguable is how are these really impacting um, the, 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 the energy efficiency? For example, prefetching. Um, <clears throat> prefetchers are usually not perfect. They don't have 100% accuracy. So they are many times uh, bringing data to the cache that is not really useful. So all of this is um, spending, I mean, it's maybe something that you're not going to notice in the execution time, but for sure you will notice it in the memory consumption. 
and that in the energy consumption, sorry. And that's um, something that we um, should also try to avoid. And it's something that probably processing in memory can solve because in the end, in processing in memory, what you're gonna do is instead of bringing the data, what you're going to do is moving the computation to these new processing elements that we are going to have or these new processing capabilities that we are going to have inside memory. And the last thing is that you will work ha uh, hands-on, doing different things that will depend on your, on your project, that will depend on your preference. And, and, and we are not going to talk about the, the possible projects today. We will do that in, in our next meeting, next Thursday. But for now, what I can tell you is that uh, you will either analyze workloads, like uh, modern workloads, like let's say machine learning or graph processing, interesting workloads that we we know that um, are important these days. You will analyze them using um, different uh, software tools that um, that are commercially available. Some of them, others are uh, um, available uh, like uh, products of the academic research. Uh, we have some of them. You will be able to use them, and you will um, decide or you will identify what are the uh, suitable workloads or parts of them. Um, for processing in memory, because uh, when seeing parts of them, it's also something that you can imagine, right? The, during the execution of a program, there are different phases, and some of these phases are going to be more memory bound, and then they are going to be better for uh, PIM, and some others will be more probably compute bound, or they will have more data reuse, so they can benefit more from the caches, and uh, they will. Um, usually be good or be better for the CPU or the GPU in the end, the, the main processor or the host processor. Um, one thing, one other thing that you can do here is programming uh, real world PIM architecture. And this is something um, really uh, exclusive that we have access to because there are no commercially available processing in memory architectures yet, yet. but um, we have access to one of them. I'm going to show you um, um, actually, I can show you already the next slide um, where you can see this um, UPM uh, processing in DRAM engine, um, which is um, developed by, by a French company called uh, UPM. As you can see in this picture, the, 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 um, what they produce are DIMMs that uh, resemble the conventional DRAM DIMMs, but inside these chips, we uh, not only have DRAM arrays, but also some small in order processors that are called DPUs and are these um, processing in memory cores. And um, we have access to this server. We have uh, already actually several projects on this um, um, technology. Um, and yeah, one of the um, things that we will propose to you is uh, that you program your own workloads on this PIM architecture. Um, and then uh, you will also be able to explore new PIM proposals and simulate them in, in, the, in the architecture simulators that we typically use in our research. So good thing here is that you can, um, from, from, from the things that you will learn from from reading papers, from discussing with your uh, mentors or advisors and the um, things that you will propose by yourself or, 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 or we propose to you, you will be able to simulate your own architectures and, um, and who knows, maybe you come up with a very uh, nice solution. Okay, this is the UPM architecture and now uh, key takeaways, what you will uh, end up learning or what you will mm, gain from this uh, PNS. First thing is that you will learn more things about computer architecture, in particular uh, processing in memory, which is like a very, um, a very hot trend these days. Um, you will develop your technical skills, like for example, um, programming uh, parallel PIM architectures or uh, doing architecture simulation. Um, you will develop your critical thinking analysis. This is something that you usually do in all, in all your courses, which is very good. 
you will interact with us. Um, and this is especially, uh, I would say, especially good if you are interested in, in research or doing research in the future. Um, um, I, I, I can say that um, the group is, um, is uh, very nice and, and people who um, have a lot of experience uh, already in research. So you can learn a lot from, from us, from interacting with us. Um, you will get familiar with important research directions these days in the field of computer architecture, and you will also um, improve your uh, um, skills as a, a presenter. Because uh, in the end, at the very end of the of the course, you will have to uh, present, prepare a presentation and and present your work uh, to all of us. Okay, the key goal of the course, if it's not clear yet, is how to learn to how, uh, how to overcome the data movement bottleneck by programming, benchmarking, and exploring different designs of the PIM computing paradigm. Um, and this is all I don't know, guys. You, do you have any questions so far? Or I can just continue. Okay, I assume I can continue. So the prerequisites of the course, this is uh, something you uh, already know, probably because you read it before, before you enrolled. Um, it's required to have some knowledge about digital design and computer architecture. Probably this is something that you all uh, have because you, you may have um, um, studied a similar course, if not with uh, Professor Mutlu, uh, with someone else, if not in ETH somewhere else, but but I'm pretty sure that you will have this knowledge. Uh, then familiarity with C and C++ programming. This is um, usually very useful. For example, I mentioned before the UPM architecture. So uh, programming there is essentially C with some understanding of parallelism as well. Um, or simulators are also C or C++. So um, if, you, if you're going to play with some simulator, it's also good that you um, have you know certain skills uh, with C and C++ and then it would be desirable but not strictly necessary because you know it can be useful for your project as well if you have already some uh, background in FPGA implementation or GPU programming and of course uh, another uh, three more prerequisites are your interest in future computer architecture and computing paradigms, discovering why things do or do not work uh, and solving problems, and interest in making uh, systems efficient and usable. This is uh, something that uh, we also assume that you have. Uh, who are we? Um, well, first of all, talk about Professor Mudlu. Uh, he joined ETH in uh, 2017. Uh, sorry, in 2015, um, uh, he was previously in the um, Department of uh, Informatics. Now he moved to ITET. Uh, before uh, joining ETH, he was at uh, Carnegie Mellon University, and he uh, has worked in uh, several companies, uh, main main ones like uh, Google, VMware, Microsoft Research, etc. Um, here you have uh, all his uh, website and contact information in this website, for example, projects, you can find all, all of his papers and, um, and yeah, essentially what he does is research and teaching. Um, uh, the, the, the main topic is uh, computer architecture, computer, computer systems, hardware security, bioinformatics, and then um, like all the different um, uh, areas uh, in, in this main topic, like um, a special emphasis on memory and storage systems, hardware security, safety, predictability, fault tolerance, etc. And these are the rest of us. Uh, this is me, Juan, and then you have four more supervisors, uh, Dr. Hayu Mao, uh, Geraldo Constantinos, and Nika. Geraldo Constantinos and Nika are PhD students in Professor Mutlu's group. Um, so, yeah, you will have a good chance to, to know us. We will have uh, several meetings over the course of the semester, uh, but uh, you can also learn more about our uh, group uh, and about the people who are part of the group in this website. And here you see, um, yeah, 
few people here. It's uh, at the moment more than 38 uh, researchers um, in our group. So it's a very large group, as you can imagine. And uh, yeah, I already mentioned the uh, uh, research uh, that uh, Professor Mudlu does. Here you, you see uh, a little bit more uh, detail, uh, computer architecture, hardware, software, bioinformatics, and then um, yeah, uh, yeah, all the different topics, memory and storage, heterogeneous and parallel systems, GPUs, uh, system architecture interaction, energy efficiency, um, yeah, and so on. Okay, um, what else do we have here? Uh, course requirements and um, expectations. So what do we expect, uh, what do we expect from you? First of all, that you attend all meetings, of course. Uh, so here you will have, uh, we will have meetings where everyone will be here, same as today or same as next Thursday. Um, but, and then you will also have individual meetings. Obviously, you don't need to be in the individual meeting of another uh, um, uh, colleague or, or classmate, right? Um, we, may, we may eventually uh, allow that if you're really interested or if we see that there are some synergies between the two projects that you are uh, leading by yourselves. But in principle, uh, the required attendance is the, the attendance to the meetings where uh, that are for everyone. Um, we also expect that you study the learning materials. Uh, we will talk uh, next about the materials that uh, we have already provided to you. As you may have seen, there are some required materials and then some recommended materials. I think that the recommended materials will be very recommendable. So, uh, I mean, obviously this depends as well on how much time you have. Uh, over the semester, but uh, hopefully you will have enough time to um, uh, watch and read all the materials that we provide because this way you will um, learn much more and the, the, the experience will be much fruitful for sure. Um, we expect, as you also know, that each of you uh, carry out your own uh, hands-on project. Um, there will be uh, different things here. Uh, I already mentioned uh, some things like word characterization, like uh, implementation of uh, parallel pin code or um, simulation exploration, etc. Um, on this, you will have uh, a lot of support from us. Don't don't worry about that. And um, and also we expect that you participate, you ask questions. Um, we didn't have time yet, or I didn't have time yet to create the piazza. Um, environment for you to ask questions and share ideas and and have discussions etc but it's something that we will do uh, before the next meeting and you can um, start using it like for example to um, ask questions related to the papers that you have to read to to have a better um, understanding of the of the different things that we are going to cover here um, as I said before we are going to help you we will be um, on top of you all the time. Essentially, we are going to consider you as if you were part of a research group because that's the, the way that we are used to work. Um, and I think that that um, uh, is pretty good for your progress and also for the, 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 the overall experience. And hopefully you will do very interesting things and you will learn a lot. And if you do something which is really good, um, it, it, we will consider if it makes sense to continue um, working on the project and maybe at some point to, to get it published in one uh, good conference or, or journal. And for that, um, it will, I mean, obviously is not um, something that is required to uh, pass this course or something uh, like that, but it can uh, be also like a very uh, good way of, uh, you know, um, improving even more the, the overall experience. Okay, um, yeah, uh, in this slide you have the course website. I assume that you have already visited it. Um, you have uh, useful information there. Um, for example, um, we will, there, there are already like some learning materials that are recommended. At some point, they may be required. For now, they are just recommended. Um, there, we will also upload the slides. For example, these slides that I'm presenting today, you will find, it, find them there. 
And, um, and as I mentioned before, we will also have Piazza for questions and answer. And, uh, and we also um, expect from you that you check your email uh, frequently for the different, uh, different announcements that, that we will do over the semester. And these are the materials for this meeting. Um, these materials, uh, so in the end, there are only like two required materials. The first one is this talk uh, by Professor Mudlu um, explaining like uh, different, so what's the concept of processing in memory, what are the benefits of processing in memory, and what are different approaches to processing in memory. And then um, uh, similar content, contents, uh, uh, probably more um, elaborated, you can find also in this paper, which is a kind of survey of um, different works and uh, with a special emphasis on on uh, research works from from our group so these two are the uh, required materials and you can definitely um, expand your knowledge by going through the recommended materials as well um, the first one is a, um, is a is another research is another survey paper and this time it's more focused on the workloads rather than the um, architectural proposals as the as the first one so it's also uh, very interesting for you to read good thing here is that the more you learn the easiest will be to um, to learn more and to simulate uh, more um, uh, concepts so um, I'm pretty sure that after you watch the first um, video the first lecture and then uh, you read this paper everything will be much easier so um, in the end, what you have here is a different perspective of um, um, of um, some uh, other research works. And then uh, you also have these three lectures in computation in memory or processing in memory that are um, were taught last year, last last uh, fall semester by Professor Mutlu in the um, computer architecture master's course. Uh, they are very comprehensive, and you, as you will see. Um, when you watch them you will see that uh, many of the contents of these three lectures are already in the previous surveys that you read or the or the initial um, talk and as i said the good thing here is that you will learn progressively and and and, and as you learn more the easiest will be uh, to to understand the new concepts any questions regarding the materials or how to deal with them or anything? Okay. What will we do in the next uh, meeting, which will be uh, next Thursday? Um, so we will uh, talk about the projects. We will announce the projects and we will describe what they are about. Maybe we may even give you some um, example for you to understand better what they are about. Um, this is something that we will see depending on the questions that you have. And after that, we will suggest that you uh, somehow bid for a project uh, or select the project that you uh, think that is um, best for you. Uh, and after that, we will somehow evaluate if that's the right decision or not based on your background. Um, and based on your interest and skills, we will have face-to-face uh, uh, -face meetings with you, or face-to-face in, in, in Zoom, probably, and, and we will discuss how suitable the project you selected is, um, is really for you. We will, in the end, it's uh, like explaining uh, many more details about the project itself so that you can really understand if it's, that's the right thing for you or not. And if it's not, then we will probably find something that is more suitable. So don't worry about that. Um, what is important is that before this uh, second meeting, you study all the learning materials, at least the required ones. Why is that? Because this is going to uh, make much easier for you to understand what the, uh, what the proposed projects are about. And, um, and then after that, after the second meeting, we will start scheduling individual meetings, uh, of course, to each of you, and depending on what's the, um, the, the 
a specific project that you have chosen, um, we will give you more materials, we will ask you to read papers, we will ask you to maybe watch uh, tutorials or and so on, and, but this will be like more focused on the thing that you have to do. Um, we will likely have more, let's say, group meetings with all of us um, at some point, um, because probably we, we will deliver some uh, tutorials or some uh, short talks of our recent uh, research works, and this can also be um, very good for you to, to learn more and get more familiar with uh, different things that may not be the things that you're um, working on hands-on. And finally, the last thing that we will have is the presentation of your work. For this, we will schedule one uh, day, one, one meeting at the very end of the semester, or maybe a couple of them is if we need them because you are, um, you are six, so depending on um yeah on how long these presentations are we may need uh, like a couple of meetings but this is something that we will uh, decide as the as the, when the end of the uh, semester is approaching okay this is all i have uh, regarding this presentation i think i we already consume all, uh, almost 45 minutes do you guys have any questions regarding the course logistics, the contents, the, the goals of the course, etc. Or maybe um, any any one of the supervisors want to add something. Nika, Geraldo, Constantinos, hi you. Oh Stefano, do you want yes, to ask I have something? A question about uh, the scheduling. Is it planned to have this uh, like from 6 to 8 p.m. on a Thursday, is this uh, planned for the whole uh, weeks now or is it like only a few times? Um, so in, for now we just have uh, this meeting and the, and the meeting next week. Uh, we can definitely discuss, so in case we need to, uh, we, we have more meetings in the future, in future weeks, and this uh, particular slot is not really suitable for you, that is um, fine. We can find another slot that is better for you guys. Okay, thank you. So, yeah, I don't know, I mean, does it work for next Thursday at least? Yes, this should be okay. Okay, that's fine. Okay, thank you. Um, so, yeah, for, for next ahead. Thursday, it's okay. But uh, normally, I have um, I have something planned on Thursday afternoon, so it would be it would be best if you'd um, if we'd do it mm -hmm. some, somewhere else. Yes, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, yeah, that is fine. So the good thing is that after next Thursday, uh, most of your meetings will be individual with uh, with your mentors, with your supervisor. So for that. I mean, we are very flexible. We are working all the time, so you don't worry about that. It will be easy to find a good slot for you. Any other questions? Okay, yeah. Um, what I'm going to do next in the next, let's say, 10 minutes or at most, <laughs> Is, uh, is to uh, introduce these um, slides uh, that are uh, the rest of the presentation. Um, it's, it's, as I said in the very beginning, it's more or less what you already have in, um, in Professor Mudlu's talk and, and the, the recommended paper and, or the required paper and the, also the recommended materials. But I think that is um, it's good to go quickly uh, for you to I mean, or for us to make sure that everyone here completely understands what the concept of processing in memory is and why it is needed. Um, and, um, and what I mentioned in the very beginning is that the main problem that we have, the main bottleneck that we have in computing systems these days is the data movement. And this data movement, um, in, in, in the beginning I mentioned the compute units and the memory units, but this uh, data movement also happens between the storage, uh, no matter if it's an SSD or a hard drive, uh, between the storage and memory, and then between memory and the, and the processor. So uh, these blue arrows represent this data movement that is uh, where 
uh, most of the uh, execution cycles uh, are consumed and um, where most of the system energy is consumed as well. And this is, um, this happening in, in, in any um, compute systems, no matter if it's a conventional CPU or it's an FPGA or it's a GPU. In the end, we have the GPU in some place, the memory in another place, and the storage in another place. And whenever we want to compute something on the GPU or the CPU or the FPGA, we have to go very far to the main memory, if not the storage, to bring the data to the uh, caches that we have and the registers and so on that we have inside the processor. So there is where um, we have this uh, data movement bottleneck. And actually, uh, one interesting thing is to, to look at the internals of any of these processors, and we will see that um, especially in a, in, in a CPU, like for example, this one, uh, you will see that most of the area of the chip is devoted to storing data. There we have um, L3 cache, we have L2 cache, and also even inside the cores, we have L1 cache. So, and, and, and it's not only that, it's also like the memory controllers as well. So observe that most of the area of the system is uh, devoted to storing data. So it's devoted to, to data and the, to the data access and data movement. So um, these are uh, three key system trends. First one is data is the major bottleneck, as we were saying, because applications are increasingly data hungry, and this is happening more and more these days with all these uh, big data era. The energy consumption is a key limiter, and this is a huge problem uh in almost every computing device no matter if you uh, think about a cell phone or a laptop or a server um, energy uh, is always a problem if it's in a cell phone for example it's because uh, it relies on the battery so um, you don't have so much autonomy if it's in a data center or a, a big supercomputer it's going to be the, the the huge budget that you need to spend every year in in the electricity for that uh, system and uh, and also something that we have already mentioned before and and, and should be clear at this point is that uh, data movement dominates compute in terms of energy, but also in terms of performance. And it's because these um, continuous, continuous data movement between the off-chip uh, memory spaces or storage and the on-chip processors. Uh, this is just like one um, interesting uh, plot. Um, that Professor Mudlu uses uh, in his lectures is to compare how DRAM has improved over the course of the last uh, 20 years, um, uh, how the capacity, how much the capacity has has uh, increased, <clears throat> like uh, 128 times uh, since 1999. Bandwidth has, has also increased quite a bit, like 20 times, but latency, for example, uh, has only improved by 30%, which is uh, in principle pretty bad. Well, the reason is that uh, vendors uh, and because of the user's need uh, put more effort on increasing the capacity and increasing the bandwidth rather than the latency, but the latency is important uh, in many applications, like for example, these ones in memory databases or graph processing or data analytics and so on. Um, and there is no easy way of reducing this um, of reducing this latency. Um, in our group, for example, there are uh, uh, several people, um, including uh, Jeremy, who I think was, was in the meeting, um, but uh, so uh, several people working on improving the, the uh, reducing the, the access to the DRAM latency. But um, yeah, so you can propose different things uh, to do in the internals of the uh, DRAM array. Um, but uh, for sure, one easy way of uh, reducing this latency is to uh, move the computation closer to the memory, right? Which is the, what the, the, the processing in memory is, is all about. And so if we manage to reduce this latency, we will be able to improve the performance of many of these applications. Um, the, in, in terms of energy, uh, you already know this uh, um, slide. Um, 
the main outcome of the slide is that accessing data is much more expensive in terms of energy than uh, using this data to uh, perform computation. And from the perf performance perspective, uh, I already mentioned how the uh, data movement bottleneck affects performance is that you need to go very frequently to the main memory to get data and bring it to the caches, right? And that's something that, for example, Professor Mutlu himself experienced uh, like 70 years ago already in 2003 when he was working on his PhD thesis um, wh while uh, profiling some important applications, he found that um, the, from the total execution time, the 100% of the execution time, 55% of this execution time was spent on going to the main memory because uh, there were um, L2 uh, cache misses. So the processor tried to find tries to find data in the in the caches in the on chip caches that are close to the processing elements. And uh, if the data is not there, we have a miss. So we have to go to the main memory. We have to go to the DRAM. And this um, requires to wait many cycles. And this is also um, a lot of energy consumption. And the interesting thing is that this figure, this plot, even though it was generated 17 years ago, is, um, is still what, what we observe. And, um, and you may uh, probably uh, get familiar soon with uh, Geraldo's uh, research work, for example. And, um, and you will see that what he has observed in the year uh, 2020 is uh, very similar to what Professor Mudlu observed in, in 2003. And there is where we need processing in memory in order to alleviate all this um, data movement uh, bottleneck. Uh, actually, you, you have here like a much more recent paper. This is from a paper from Google in the year 2015. And you can see here that most of the um, execution cycles as well are spent here in this backend bound part, um, which corresponds to the core, to the cores, but also and mainly for these cases to the memory access as well. Um, here, what you can uh, see in the plot is that the um, uh, total time or the yeah the total uh, yeah execution time this uh, break uh, it, it can be uh, breakdown in in like four main parts uh, called retiring front end bound but speculation and back end bound this is what is called the uh, top down approach to analyze workloads and if you um, one of I mean the project that you focus on is about workload characterization uh, very likely you will use this um, methodology and something else later for sure to understand better because this is like the first approach to this um, uh, workload characterization or workload analysis so the problem is that the way that computers are designed these days uh, it's um, it's really uh, uh, a waste of energy and and a, and a major uh, performance bottleneck. So what it makes sense is that instead of uh, working uh, with the data so far from where the data resides in the in the CPU, why don't we put the processors closer to the data, right? And this is somehow against what uh, von Neumann proposed in, in, in 1946. Uh, von Neumann proposed that we would have some compute unit, the processor, and we will have some memory and storage, and in between, uh, some way of communicating these two, right? But the thing is that this thing, the memory and the storage are, are too fast from the compute units, and we spend too many cycles and a lot of energy on going through this communication unit. So we uh, go back to, to this plot uh, where, where we really see what the problem is. Um, over the years, uh, the, the way, and I was mentioning in the beginning of the presentation that there are different ways of trying to alleviate what are the, um, the, the problems of the data movement bottleneck, but um, uh, these, all these solutions are, are somehow um, inefficient, complex, and low performance. And when I'm talking about these solutions, I'm talking about uh, prefetching, I'm talking about caches, I'm talking about many different solutions that uh, in some way work and work well, 
but uh, they also make the processor design very very complex and 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 the, and the worst part is that they don't work well always right and for many of the modern workloads as as you will see by yourselves um they don't uh, work well at all like for example in graph processing you you will see that there are a lot of um, um accesses with very large strides or very random and in those cases um it's going to be very difficult that we can find the data um in in the in the on chip caches or it's going to be very very difficult that a, pro, a prefecture works well um so in these cases um, using uh, processing in memory techniques can greatly uh, improve performance and the energy efficiency. This is just one more slide to motivate the data movement uh, bottleneck. Uh, this is a system on chip where you have CPU, GPU, you have uh, um, also accelerators, you have cache. This is very similar what you can uh, find in, in, in the internals of your cell phone, for example, and then you have DRAM, and uh, among all these components, we have a lot of data movement all the time. Um, here you have some numbers about how much energy is spent or some certain type of workloads um, and uh, motivation of why we need uh, processing in memory. So, yeah, there are different approaches to processing in memory uh, to improve the uh, performance and the energy efficiency but in the end in some way the the the, the uh, uh, how to say um like the the way of operation here is going to be uh, more or less uh, very similar in all cases we will keep having a main processor like what what we're going to call the host processor it may be a cpu or maybe a gpu this processor is um, in general very powerful and has uh, quite large caches uh, but this is not enough to have good performance and energy efficiency so that's why we have to uh, propose processing in memory solutions which um, what essentially will do is offloading some of the computation to the memory and uh, and this orange thing here that represents the compute capability um, in the memory can be um, can have many different shapes and, and and you will get familiar to all these shapes but uh, in the end as you can see no matter if this is happening uh, in the internals of the memory or there are compute units that are closer to these uh, memory arrays or whatever uh, in the end uh, um, we, we will have this offloading model where most of or the computation somehow starts in the processor but at some point we offload uh, to memory as if we were uploading to an accelerator or to a GPU uh, to make this more efficient. And there are many questions to answer um, and that's why we do researching um, and processing in memory and that's why uh, we offer this um, course to you as well. And all the different things that we still have to uh, answer are related to the whole stack from the devices to the algorithms and the programming languages. Um, yeah, these are some uh, forms of uh, processing in memory possibilities like, for example, having um, these uh, 3D stack memories, uh, you, you, you will read about them in the, in the survey papers that we are proposing uh, or, or we have provided. Um, these 3D stack memories uh, have like several layers, several uh, which, which uh, compose the memory stack. It's like the DRAM arrays, but they also have a logic layer. And inside this logic layer, we can put some compute units that uh, we're going to be able to use for uh, processing in memory. But there might be other ways of doing processing in memory as well, or, or also called processing near memory. For example, instead of uh, uh, computing directly in memory, you can have some PIM units or some uh, near data or near memory computing units in the memory controller itself of the CPU or maybe in the in the uh, DRAM DIM as a separate unit or directly inside the DRAM chip as, as I mentioned um, in the beginning of the presentation in this uh, UPMM technology. And these are like the different uh, types of units that you can have. They, they can be like some sort of uh, general purpose cores as if they were um, the small CPUs or small GPUs, or maybe we can have some sort of reconfigurability like FEGAs or um, fixed function units, like small accelerators for a very specific operation. Uh, we will, you will get familiar with these different types of, uh, 
of um, processing capabilities. And, um, and in the end, and this is where I'm going to stop, there are, uh, there are like many different, so uh, yeah, many different proposals to processing in memory. Uh, we usually distinguish between uh, two main ones and they are summarized here in this presentation. You, you will also see in this presentation some uh, samples of the two main trends. Um, and essentially, uh, even though we are not using this terminology in this presentation, but um, you will find this terminology in the in the recommended survey papers. Um, we distinguish between two main uh, types of processing in memory. One way is processing near memory and the other way is processing using memory. The first one, processing near memory, is like the uh, most obvious, obvious thing that you can think about. I have memory here and I put some small processor next to it. And this way, I don't need to go all the way through this uh, communication unit that von Neumann uh, defined, but I just uh, tell this small course, hey, do, hey you please uh, do this uh, computation for me. And that's what we call processing near memory, because in reality, you have memory and you have a small core that is next to it. But then there is another solution uh, that is called uh, processing using memory, which is uh, like, um, yeah, from my point of view is like even more amazing because uh, it directly uses the memory to be able to perform computation. And, and there you can find uh, proposals from our group like Rogue Clone, like, like Ambit and, and also other things that we um, keep working on and at some point we, we may introduce to you. And there essentially means that you are going to use the DRAM cells themselves to perform the computation. And this is not only possible in DRAM, but also with other um, memory technologies that are being used these days. You might have heard about uh, RERAM, you might have heard about uh, PCM or STTM RAM, which are alternatives to the DRAM technology that um, have their own uh, pros and cons, but also can be used to do this uh, processing in memory. Um, yeah, I want to stop here because I don't want to take more than an hour of your time. Um, let me know, guys, if you have any questions so far. Um, if not, um, we just simply stop. <laughs>